fine, thank you, but it's okay. <laughs> if y'all are comfortable on that, take a mask off briefly to do a quick introduction. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm Ashby Kent from the University of Montana. Uh, in the English department, as I was just discussing, the new uh, dean of the graduate school. Um, if you're new to one of these events, how many of you have not been to one of the previous two events? I don't have oh, okay, quite a few. Okay, good. So um, this is the Reimagining Death series. Uh, we're extremely happy to have partnered with a number of community um, organizations to um, take uh, National Endowment for the Humanities programming out into the public. So this is an NEH-funded project. Um, and there are strands of it uh, that you'll be hearing about in the year to come. Uh, one is focused on social justice, so there'll be events on, uh, on campus and in the community around social justice. Uh, there'll be events on indigenous uh, speakers, uh, organized by Heather Partley and uh, Kate Shanley and, and the Native American Studies uh, Department. Some really incredible programming actually coming up quite soon, so look out for that. And then this third strand is the strand that I run, which is about um, death, dying, and grief. And the idea of it is we're trying to pull in uh, the public to have conversations about this really important topic. But we're doing it not in medical context and not in legal context, but in through art and through literature. So um, we had a, a first talk on poetry, the poetry of grief and grieving, um, and then a second talk on Hindu uh, beliefs about death, dying, and grief. My understanding is those were recorded and they will eventually make it up on uh, the library website, so you'll, you'll be able to go and look at those um, uh, at a later time. Tonight's first time we're trying to live uh, stream on Facebook, and we're hoping that will be a kind of an ongoing thing, but we are delighted that you're here. Uh, it's part of what's going on in our community is we're trying to open up again and see one another again, and, and we're being prudent about it, which I appreciate as well, but it's a way for us to share a common space and talk about this really important topic. Um, universal in import, right? That it, it literally is going to hit every single person in this room in some way or another. So, um, so the, the spirit of the event is that um, we have speakers who come and talk and open up ideas for us, and then they turn it over to us as a group, and we ask questions, and we, um, we talk as a community, um, and we use this, this space as a way to kind of explore this really important topic. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, on your way out, you can grab flyers. Um, we would really appreciate um, feedback you can give us uh, um, about the event itself. It, it helps us kind of shape future iterations of the event. Um, this series will be running throughout the year. We'll be doing events here at the Missoula Public Library. We'll be doing film screenings. Um, there's a lot of really exciting things going on, and it will happen kind of looks now all the way through about a year from now. We'll, we'll have some events next year in January, February as well. Um, so feedback would be really helpful. If you want to have your name on an, a mailing list um, that will directly mail you about upcoming events with reminders, there'll be a sheet circulating. Make sure you put your name down on that. Um, and I think that's it. Any other questions? Okay, well so obviously you came for this rock star, uh, Heather Cahoon. Um, her book, Horsefly Dress, I'm holding it here, uh, is available in bookstores locally. In fact, the fiction carries it, Shakespeare and Company carries it. Um, if you haven't read it, you should. It's amazing. Um, and Heather, Heather comes to us by way of the um, University of Montana Native American Studies program, but has a long background working uh, in the state on policy. And so recently has had uh, great success funding through um, uh, external funding a new institute called the American Indian Governance Policy Institute, ACPI, ACPI? You know, we just refer to it as the Policy Institute. The Policy Institute. <laughs> and it's an amazing initiative that's basically going to make UN research available to the tribes to work out new policy agreements that are going to benefit tribes. Um, so that's a fair shorthand. She yeah, might yeah, extrapolate yeah. on more. <laughs> Um, so she, she is an incredibly multi-talented person, is the point, and, and as well as a, a, a really talented visual artist and a poet, which is what we're going to talk about today. Joining her is Amy Rado parks my uh, colleague of many, many years in the English department, who has recently moved into the Writing and Public Speaking Center. Um, and also, she and I have worked quite a few years now, going yeah. back four years, um, in the Institute of Health and Humanities. She's the executive director of that organization which, again, tries to focus on the nexus between humanistic uh, thinking and art 
um, with uh, health and medicine, the ways in which we can understand our health better if we engage with the community. So um, we are extremely lucky to have her guide this conversation with Heather. Please help me welcome Heather. Hi, everyone. Um, we would like to start out with, we'll talk a little bit and have ask, Heather will read some poems and talk and read and talk and read. But I, I would really, as Ashby was saying, like to hear from you all after a, a certain chunk of time. And whatever your questions you have about poems or themes about uh, themes of things that uh, some of you are, are studying this this semester, themes that have come up and maybe how it relates or doesn't relate to some of the things we talk about. Or even for some of you, if you are, are in the room as writers also and have been in the situation where you are also trying to find ways to get words to work with a sense of grief, whether it, it's uh, so many different kinds of grief. So I'm, I'd be curious after to hear maybe even some of your experiences or thoughts or barriers or conflicts um, with that sort of thing, because I think it, it is also something that so many of us, uh, a certain struggle a lot of us share. All right. Um, so before we start just talking about this book directly, I wondered, um, Heather, if you would tell us a little bit about, and we have a little bit of your, your professional job now, but a little bit about how you, how you came into like writing, how what, what yeah. that has meant in your, in your early years or what some of your first remembered experiences of words and memory. Yeah. So I always say, you know, I've, I've loved poetry ever since I can ever remember. Um, and I also feel like I have always written poetry, but back when we were in elementary school, we didn't learn to write until I think first grade. Yeah. I feel like they write <laughs> preschool now, but... Um, you know, I don't remember writing a, a poem. I can't remember. I mean, I was always journaling and always writing, and um, I published my first poem when I was 12. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess I'm speaking to Amy since she asked I know, the question, but I'll, I'll speak to you guys. Because this Sorry. mic doesn't mic, it doesn't amplify. Okay, well, thank you. We'll be louder. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I don't remember really when I... Jeez, yeah. I feel like this is like the... I know, sorry. I asked you a first question that you're like, I don't know. <laughs> well, the problem of like the right? news anchor, like you speak to the camera or speak to I the know. person. Um, but yeah, so I, I feel like I have always written poetry, always, mm -hmm. you know, read poetry. Um, I, I have just always been drawn to it. Did people in your family or how did your family respond to that? Um, well, so I'm like very much an outlier in my family with my interests. Mm -hmm. Like I never liked hunting or <laughs> just, I mean, I really like driving around the woods, driving around our reservation, camping, those types of things. But um, like I was never interested in like working on my car or like knowing how these different types of things um, worked. Like uh, uh, I was very much always reading all yeah. the time and... Um, but my, and I also played the piano and I drew all the time and did things like that. And, um, and I think my parents just thought it was very interesting because, I mean, my dad is actually an amazing artist, um, but he doesn't, he just does it periodically. But yeah, so I think they were, they, they always liked that I did it and they always think everything I do is interesting, but um, yeah, I feel like a kind of an outlier. It's like great. Um, it's one of my like. I'm always curious about that question for people who write. Like, if, if they were surrounded, you know, with these myths of writers, right? That they were born into homes with libraries, and um, you know, are fostered from an early age. Um, but that seems to be not a story that I actually hear from a lot. A lot of people who really regularly write and um, continue doing it. Um, so I wondered. I wondered if you might start by. Um, sharing a couple poems just to read um, and maybe telling us a little bit about who Horse Fly Dress is and introducing us to your poems. Yeah. Heather, if you read, would you mind standing up? I still think people in the back maybe are struggling. We could scoot forward and yeah. over a little yeah. if that yeah. wouldn't bother. That'd be okay? Right. We could come a little closer. 
And, and people are, are there's a couple of chairs here. I'm more than one. We can get closer. Yeah. Yeah. Come up and get closer and that would help. I can get up on. And um, she is Coyote's daughter. Um, so he has, in some stories, he has four sons, and some he has five, but he always just has one daughter. And her name is Chatnox. And in English, it's horsefly dress. A long wing feather propels the stunted body of a black crowned night heron through air breaking apart the dried mouth of memory. In an outpouring of primordial story, I hear her name, Chaffnox. The hunting moon unearths Coyote's eldest and only daughter. Her name no longer spoken, she turned to porous stone. But I hear her name, Chaffnox, along Flathead River near Rive, in the cutting of meat its crackled drying above smoldering cottonwood. Chatanox at the edge of river in passing water, the embodiment of belief, she perforates the divide between known and unknown. Here, she reconsiders the archaeology of our suffering. Her mouth opens in the alarm cry of a brown thrasher. A warning, brace for all that's wrapped into a name. And are you interested in having one, another one about her, or sure. just what, however any, you? No, just want to. surged into the center of the world, the word pulled back into heavy honey yellow lines and scarlet patches drawn across the slight shoulders of certain blackbirds. But reality rubs raw the wounds of all stories until the scoured bones of self-evidence are all that's left. Battling inside this warm shell of space, we find stories are no different from other living forms, the ragged hair aligned with every primal instinct to avoid demise. Consider coyote, head bone raised to greet the night, song through black tree moss like witch's hair. He delivers a message bound in the body of unwritten texts like birds ring-necked and refined, his cries confirm the unbelievable. Two, I count the breaths between bodies, each syllable thrust from the chest, from Salish to English and back, Francis to Clara, Antoine, Otwin, Malisupi, through Supi, Piel, back to Hollips, or Shining Shirt, the medicine person who saw men in long robes, the sign of a cross, saw it all flung into being when, in slurred double whistles on the midwinter cusp of forest and field, a black cat chickadee sang the shadow sounds of his name. But even before that, the forest stood smoldering, apparitions with arms raised toward the sky. So in this story, in this book, there's a series of stories, and it relies heavily on story individually, um, both story as it unfolds in your life now with your own family and stories that you have learned and stories that have come to you. So can you, this is, I mean, all of my questions I thought of after was reading this, if anyone read this, are very big questions. Um, so we might have to bring them down a notch. But, I, but I'm curious about how story and grief are connected to each other, both the stories we get given to us and the stories that we remember or misremember 
or get corrected later, or we hear different versions of, or how, yeah. how story and memory and grief connect? Oh, I think they're so intertwined because, um, you know, I once read that if somehow we, we lost, you know, temporarily our memory of those things through um, our life that had, like, just very gravely aggrieved us, um, you know, we wouldn't actually be bothered by them because we wouldn't be able to remember them, you know, and so... Um, I think that those stories that we form of those instances of grief um, are really, really impactful. And I've, some of the book is about, um, you know, sort of reshaping those narratives into um, ones where, I mean, you can transmute or transform those instances in, I think, very powerful and effective ways just by just modif modifying those narratives. Could you, can you think of one that you could read, or like even just to share that as an example? Because I, yeah. I agree, it's powerful. It's very powerful, the experience of trying to write about a certain thing and realizing that it turns into something else, or that the language itself yeah. tells a different story after it yes. makes a different sort of sense. Yeah, so at this poem, it's right near the end. It's the third to the last one, but it's, mm. it's about exactly mm. that. And it's called Magpies. <clears throat> A magpie flock float jumps down the hill from one tree to another, bypassing us on the short switchbacks, a game of leapfrogged, a wing cacophony of chatter, and black, blue, iridescent bodies, their tails, flight feathers fanned, white wingtips flashing. After three passes, they cut quickly to the bottom, clustering in a stunted sarvisberry bush, tangle of offshoots near its base, hardly large enough to hold them all. My young son dashes toward them, not to capture or frighten, but for glee, that of a child, the fun and freedom found in racing toward a treasure. Nevertheless, they disperse, an ellipsis shattered, black-bodied bird dots scatter in all directions, their absence revealing a gift tucked snugly amongst branches, its blue packaging unmistakable, unopened tobacco. We use it to make an offering, an earnest prayer of thanks. Earlier near the hilltop, among so many trailside forget-me-nots, diminutive bright sky blue petals with white starred centers, Goldenrod iris and storm cloud pupils, eyes nonetheless, watching, witness to the omen of the pygmy owl manifesting as the death of pernicious preoccupation and remnant terror, the slow release of bluebirds trapped inside my throat. There are so many images, and when the first one you read too, you said the dry mouth of memory. And there are so many images in this book of um, either throat or mouth open in a cry or an unreturned call. You know, a, a cry that doesn't get answered or a uh, call out um, or something held. Yeah. Um, which, when I read it, I, fe I feel really viscerally, you know, while I'm reading it, and it, the, the idea of it not being answered or it being dry. Yeah. I'm, so the, yeah. the epigraph in here is from Ted Hughes. And, um, and when I read, I mean, when I read it, I, it just was like the most striking lines I had read, I mean, in, <laughs> in my recent memory. But this comes from his poem called Wolf Watching. And the lines are, the cry you dare not cry in these moments will last you a lifetime. Yeah, I just thought that was so beautiful and just such a powerful um, statement. Yeah. Because then it's, so a cry is not words even, but it's communication, right? And I think that, I think that is part of, it, it, when we can't even, I know as a young person, um, I remember one of my first experiences with big grief was not being able to cry and then feeling so shamed about that after. Like, I couldn't even figure out how to grieve right at the funeral because I, it was like my body wanted to do it, but nothing, like nothing would happen. Um, and it felt 
it felt, it just felt like the image at the end of that was just stuck. Like, well, I, I absolutely yeah. think that that's what happens uh, with our um, unexpressed emotions. Is this, they stay in you and they can just be inside you, I think, until you can dislodge them. But I think that process is really valuable because then it helps you make sense and make uh, meaning of those experiences. And um, so in my policy work, um, we're focused on historical and contemporary traumas and resilience. So it's really critical to also examine resilience. And so in the mid 90s, um, these two psychologists came up with the um, idea of post-traumatic growth and um, you know, related to resiliency and what is it that somehow um, enables some people to sort of integrate those instances of grief or those very difficult times when other people have less um, sort of uh, ability to pass through them unscathed. I mean, and there's, there's a lot of research out there that talks to why, but one of them is um, that you have people around you with whom you can, um, well, who support you basically. And um, there's a, also an idea that I really love called benevolent. Um, so it's sort of the uh, opposite of the adverse childhood experiences. Yes. It's the benevolent childhood experiences, yes. which I also think, there's, yeah, there's counterbalance. Yeah. 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 You and I have talked in the past about um, writing and grief and trauma. And I'm curious, I know um, there, there's a certain moment at which trying to write about those experiences it is, I think sometimes we hope that it would be like, and now I've written about it, and I feel so much better, um, and it's finished. <laughs> right. It's all finished now, and I can move on, um, which isn't true based on like almost a any person's creative work. You watch it just like loop back to the same, you know, some of the same things. But what is, what is your experience like with trying to either with these poems or, or other pieces of writing of, of trying to trying to access something that you can't figure out what you're trying to access, or trying to write a poem that you can't finish, or trying to write about something grief filled or heavy in that way. Well, it I, is evading language, right? What a question. So many. <laughs> put in language. Your experience is not being able to put in language. <laughs> well, I think that, um, I mean, so much of what happens to us and even our interactions with other people um, has nothing to do with language. Yeah. And I think that's why art is so powerful is because it doesn't require, I mean, it just, you can be so impacted, so affected by a painting or by, you know, a sunrise or just by so many things that are, um, you know, there's no, like, uh, verbal um, it's exchange. not a barrier. Right, yeah, this, right. there's not a symbolic exchange. Yeah. Right, that, which is, writing is so heavily symbolic. Oh, yeah, even absolutely. Even the process of typing is symbolic versus, right. you know, <laughs> using a pen. Yeah. Right, but I think that's one of the reasons that um, art does lend itself, I feel like, more easily to articulating some of those, um, I guess, occasions, because you can use metaphor and, um, you know, you can describe it without describing it, kind of. Yeah, the sense of the feeling. I, yeah, yeah, it was it, a couple weeks ago, Chris Tippett had John O'Donohue on, on being, and he said, of course, beautifully like everything he says is beautiful and he's like well I think music would be what writing would be if it could <laughs> because it doesn't because it isn't stuck in words um, and, and, and writing and rewriting you know I know I've had drafts of work where I, I'm very happy with the draft and then I go change one thing but then it changes what what the actual thing <laughs> says and then and then I can't tell which thing what, what is what is supposed to be true right and I, and I remember so we we met in graduate school approximately oh, a million years ago. <laughs> and, um, and that was a thing that I felt I got so stuck on during that time was what, what is the job of certain kinds of creative work in terms of like being true? Do, like what are we beholden to in terms of circumstantial truth or fact-based truth versus an, an emotional truth of, of a sense of what, seeing something beautiful or feeling something traumatic or the sense of, of like a sudden grief return, mm -hmm. right, is not, um, is, is a truth you can capture that 
can, you can conjure the rest of the circumstance in order to create that, that sensory truth. Um, but I haven't totally worked out how, <laughs> how that predictably works. Uh-huh. Um, but I see, I see in, in some of your poems looking at how dream, for example, there are, there are pieces in this, um, there are a lot of dreams in this, and how they, how they bring a different kind of story or a different kind of truth or a different kind of emotional truth. I wondered if you would read one or two of those. Or yeah. what would you like to tell us about the dream portions of this? Um, well, I often have dreams that are just so vivid and striking that that I, I remember them for days and I wonder about them. And, um, and so there, there's a lot of poems in here. Um, that are yeah, examples I pull a of lot from because they're so strange. <laughs> I know, and I've kind of wondered about yeah. including them in here because I was like, oh, these people who are like into dream analysis are going to be like, well, she has this and that problem, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> I put them in here. Obviously, <laughs> this is <laughs> no, but they're so. Such, if you when you read the manuscript, they arrive at a place where they they're like a little gear change, right? Like they, yeah. they change what's happening in the feeling of the poems where it's not a rest necessarily, but it's an immersion into a different sense of space or a different sense of nature. And and the poems themselves even are, are in prose blocks. They look a little bit different. And they have a different um, <clears throat> sort of, yeah, uh, the syntaxis, yeah, yeah, is... So I guess I'll read one of my favorite ones, actually. It's about my dad. Oh, it's about our parents. Oh, it's called A Dream of a Darling Boy. And did you want me to stand? Or could you hear me okay last time? It's people in the back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, is this boy my father? I wondered later upon waking... He was a boy from home that much I could recognize. His dark hair, lively eyes, glossy black, a muted smile I could only describe as darling. I am walking with my sister near Dixon, Flathead River to the north, snow deep, maybe four feet. We visit as we walk in an elevated wooden structure, a sidewalk of sorts paralleling the highway. Mid-sentence, I sense someone behind us. Looking back, I see this boy. He appears to be three or four years old. He is bashful. He is shirtless, shoeless, has no jacket, clothed only in a pastel yellow jumpsuit, a romper, thin straps stemming from waistband up over bare shoulders back down to opposite waistband and back. Why is he all alone? It is winter, why is he not properly dressed? And why does he not seem to mind the cold, I wonder? As I glance down at his feet, frostbitten, freezer-burned flesh, dry and cracking, each toe, the whole foot and ankles, eating its way up his small legs. He smiles at me, but keeps a safe distance. This little boy, who earlier I described as darling, who, on second thought, is more accurately described as daring, but to spoo, he dares to be. Yeah. And I have, I have also in here, I could read, um, it's also one of, it's not one of my favorite the, poems, the but it's, oh, like the, the, the baby fire in the water. <laughs> that sounds no, terrible. No, 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 it's um, Oh, yeah. No, not the black one. Um, Well, I have this dream of wolves. That's the only dream I've ever had The o- that I dreamed in reverse. And I woke up and I was just like, what in the world? I was crazy. Yeah. It was so amazing. And um, so I thought about that for days and days and days. And first off, like, how could you? I was like, how could you even dream something in reverse? And, um, and then it wasn't until I, I wondered, well, I... I wonder if I reversed the dream and it played forward, if it would make sense, and it did, and it was absolutely just the most amazing message. And so I wrote a poem about that that I could yeah. I could read. Um, yeah, so this one is called A Dream of Wolves. 
Standing in an open field near Charlotte, a gray wolf stares my way. Another wolf stands next to him with his back to me. The second wolf runs backward toward me as if in a movie played in reverse. Frightened, I try not to run, begin quickly stepping away, but it is not enough. When he is just 10 feet from me, he turns and peers at me, his eyes portals to the other world. Without warning, he charges toward me an impact. We scuffle in a terror-filled blur of movements until I, I awake to find myself in a blurred battle with what I see is a wolf as he exits the fight and backs quickly away. When he is 10 feet from me, he pauses, <coughs> stares at me behind his piercing gaze. The other world opens. With mounting conviction, I step toward him quickly to scare him away. Frightened, he turns from me and flees to the safety of another wolf that is standing in an open field near Charlotte. And I actually passed by that spot in my dream. I was at my brother's house babysitting his kids one time, and I took a walk, and, I, and that was the, the, the perspective of where that dream happened. Have you ever seen a wolf in actual life? No. <laughs> but I really think in listening to them too, I was reading something this week um, that was talking about, it was, it was an interview with a neuroscientist who was talking about memory, and he was talking about Aristotle's original definition of memory, which I'll, I'll butcher the pronunciation, but it was like mimesis, it was one of those great, great words with an M and an N right next to each other. Um, but they talk, he talked about how we think now of memory as something happening in the past, and imagination as something that is happening in the future or outside and beyond. Um, but in, in Aristotle's original conception of it, he, he believed they were, they were bound. So a memory required imagination in order to be able to be created. Um, and so I got really stuck thinking about it. He talked about how um, when we do scans now, when we ask someone to remember something clearly, the, the area of imagination lights up as well as like um, the way our, our memories are working. And I think, first of all, I got really stuck thinking about that. And I, I've been working, I write a lot of poems and, been working on a memoir, and of course, in question, you know, question everything that I want to write is a memory from the past because we know logically we're reconstructing it over and over and over again. Um, especially things that we later learn were just absolutely not true. Like our parents are like, absolutely none of that's true, uh, none of it. Um, and and so, but it has been true in my memory for decades. And so, then what does that mean of of how I? conceiving of things. But then when I think about dreams, because I have a very similar uh, wake up and then walk around in a, a weird, there's like a, a weird replaying of it going at, for like a couple days, um, and it makes reality feel very altered, right? But it is, um, it must be a combination, right? It seems like remembering anybody who's had a dream that is, you know, any sort of intensity, in order to remember it, it feels like a, a combination of, like, and that it always feels imaginary because it doesn't seem real, but we're remembering a thing that didn't really happen, or it did happen. <laughs> it, it always <laughs> operates in that liminal space, but mm -hmm. I think it's a great, the reason that I really appreciated those moments in this book is that it also, it really, it asked the question quietly throughout it about what, what is actually, what happens to us physically, does it have to happen to us physically for it to happen to us? And so what about the stories of our families and what about the stories of our family's histories that happen to us also and how does that come and come through? And, I, it, and, I, and so I feel like the, the expanse of those poems leaves that liminal space open um, to, to think about the relationships. And you have, I mean, you have poems. Um, and so actually before I go on to that, the, you know, the, the poem next to it, it reminded me, I wondered if you, in talking about liminal space and in hearing these poems aloud, it feels very different than I was telling Heather my experience reading them with Salish words in here, because I don't have an, an oral pronunciation that I hear when I read those. Like, you know, we read and we're sort of hearing it to ourselves, but I, I don't have a thing to fill in. And so reading these to, my, to myself was very different than hearing them aloud, which is always true with poems, but it's, it's, it's different it's different in translation. And so I wondered if you would tell us a little bit about um, 
How and when and where those things are entering into these poems, your the Salish language, and if you wanted to talk to you about like you and Salish language. Oh, thank yeah. you. Um, you know, I don't know how or why they enter into certain poems, um, but I'm not a fluent Salish speaker. I mean, everybody at home knows lots and lots of words, prayers, you know, how to introduce yourself, you know, those types of things. But um, I would say that the amount of Salish that's in here is uh, basically mirrors my speaking ability. So vocab, basically. Um, you know, it's not any phrases, but, um, you know, sometimes I would, um, I mean, sometimes I just learned the, the word. Even one of my sons, um, he had a teacher who asked him if he knew any Salish words, and he said no. And I said, what, what about, and I started naming all these Salish words, and he said, those are in, those are Salish? Because he just knew them as, like, the meaning. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so some words are like that in here, um, that they're just the words. But some of the words I did have to look up and find. Yeah. And um, one of my relatives, fortunately, directs our culture committee, and he's fluent in Salish, and he always will help me. And... I mean, I even had to go to D.C. one time, and they wanted me to read some poems with Salish in them. So I had to text him, and he texted me voice memo, of, like, so I could make sure the pronunciation is right. But, um, yeah, so I have, uh, you know, I have to consult different people if the word is something that I, you know, this one, the chuchet, the yeah. older sister, that's not a word that I ever had said or, or knew, but I... I didn't want um, to title that in English. Just it means I, something different yeah. than if I say older sister. I mean, like someone who's just only someone who's born for me and not necessarily in a broader relationship. Um, well, this was really just about my sister who, no, was, sister. Yeah, who was born before me. <laughs> But sometimes there you go. But sometimes that's what I was like. But right. really? But sometimes I thought it was okay. Yeah. Sometimes yes. there's, um, you know, and there's also words in Salish that I and I write about this that um, they don't really translate into English. Right. Yeah. So. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And it, and I I feel like it the conversation that happens reminds me it, it is one of the things that brought forward my awareness of, of all the words in the book, right? I felt like I was reading them differently and looking at how they were fitting together differently, um, the words around those spaces. And also thinking about that, that liminal space between how story is constructed in different language or concept or idea. Oh, right, like the right. Salish root word for water, that poem? Yes. Um, I could read that one if you're interested. Um, so a lot of my dreams have, well, they used to have water, um, and now they're, like, different, but, um, where is that one? Oh, here it is, on page 25. Yeah, so this was about the time I learned the Salish root word, well, I learned the Salish word for water because it was in so many of my poems, and, um, so at our tribal health, they have, like, psychiatrists and but they also have counselors who are very culturally knowledgeable and um, this woman she uh, runs a women's sweats and um, she used to do it with her her auntie who passed away but so I knew her from that and um, she told me uh, the meaning of or she told me this story and there's other elders who have stories about the origin of the word for water in Salish um, but so this one is called the Salish root word for water. Half my life was lived in dreams of water. Nights, long hours immersed me in standing, rushing, churning, falling, frozen water. You're asking to be worthy of something, says my friend. She tells me that the Salish root word for water is self, a verb meaning to ask for permission or information, 
to make a plea to be worthy. So much is said in this word, Sally Poo. And that, that comes after Dream Home, right? So then, For, yeah. then thinking about how that one piece of information can change thinking about even whatever dream. Just helps create meaning. Yeah, yeah. yeah helps yeah. create meaning. Um, I know, I, I wonder, are there poems in here too where, um, or can, can you talk a little bit about your process of working through this book? Did this come through, did these come in pieces and come together? Or were, did you I, work with these as a project? I was just, was working as the state tribal policy analyst, <laughs> writing <laughs> poems on the side, and um, it, it took four years to write all of these poems. But there's a lot that didn't fit in with this theme. Like, for example, at one point I thought, you know, I'm going to write humorous poems, and those didn't really fit in here. <laughs> I heard that too. It's funny. People are like, ooh, that's dark. And I'm like, wait, seriously? It's trying to be so funny. <laughs> I can't <pull> it off. <laughs> Well, my, I mean, the closest I got to it was just referencing Coyote's son, who his, he named one of his sons. Well, I guess his wife also. They both must have named their children together. But So one of um, Coyote's sons is uh, named uh, uh, excrement in the middle crook of his foot. And sometimes he's, his name translates into English as um, he defecates on his leg. So that's about like yeah. the that's only okay. humor I had in here, but um, I forgot your question actually. <laughs> oh, I was asking. Oh, the yeah, process about, uh, of yeah. writing them. Yeah. So. Yeah. How does it live in the world of working on policy and grading papers and um, writing you, emails about administrative snafus? Well, it used to be. I don't know that that job. I was much more. Um, it was more like eight hours a day type work, and now I feel like this is like a hundred hours a day work that I do now, so it's not really um, easy to write, but back then it was, and I feel like um, it also involved traveling to all the reservations and uh, meeting with like tribal health directors, tribal college residents, tribal council representatives, and basically leaders in the community who had to, um, who were tasked with addressing a um, variety of social issues. And um, so in conversations with them, it, there's several poems in here oh. that are di directly related to conversations I had. Um, I think it's the third or fourth poem or so from Trees, this one. Um, that was actually uh, Jonathan Windy Boy. Um, that's about his granddaughter. Um, and he was working on a suicide prevention bill in the state legislature, and he told me this story of why it was so personal for him. And um, and then there's another one called Rilke. Well, would you read that one? The From Trees? Yeah. yeah. Uh, several of, our, of the students in the group read it and were very moved oh. by it. And, I mean, you know, sense a kind of I mean, powerful story. You know, it's, it, those were those stories that, um, of grief, in someone else's community, but there's a lot of MMIW stories that I heard that were so horrific and haunting that, I mean, they just came out in, in the poems. And um, yeah, but this one is called From Trees. Each prayer, an open mouthed cry, sometimes silent. Hers entered this world near Box Elder Creek. It hung in the sky above her house until the week following Thanksgiving when she was found in the loose leaf air, an ornament sway. Um, you know, and there's, I met with, um, at the time, I think he was the secretary, but he later became the um, chairman of the Crow tribe, and he told me this story that, um, it's, it's the reference in the first part of the Rilke, Screech Owl, and Night Moons, and um, I, there's just a lot of um, tragedy and sadness in, in those stories, and so they made it into here, which is really, like, how do we deal with these things that um, 
just tear us apart inside and how do we um, pass through those times and the reason I named it Horsefly Dress was because several years ago now I, I heard somebody say oh horse or coyote's daughter and I was like coyote has a daughter I didn't actually yeah. realize that I didn't ever really pay attention to even really his wife Julia um, you know he's like such the star of so many stories and I never I mean I had heard stories about like his sons and wolves and some monsters in Flathead Lake and you know just certain ones um, with his sons but I didn't ever um, I just had never tuned into the fact he had a daughter and so I started looking for her I was just like so interested and I wanted to know more about her and so I just started scouring all of the stories and tried to listen to stories. Often the stories that I even heard though didn't include a reference to her. And, um, but I had never read that many stories or like engaged our oral traditions to that level. And all of a sudden I understood like there, I was like, oh my God, these are actually like delivering very critical information about um, very important, very universal experiences for humans. And the metaphors were, were astounding. And the stories of coyote killing the monsters, um, you know, there's the, the freezing cold weather monster, and there's the hunger monster, and there's all of these things. And, um, and coyote teaches, uh, humans basically how to um, kill these who these people eating monsters um, through basically um, disarming them by like for example the the hunger one you know he says well, these are the things you can eat this is where you can find this animal and this is how you can harvest it and this is so he teaches them like a provides them with a a skill set or a toolbox that disarms these people eating monsters. And we, there are still people eating monsters. I mean, addiction, I mean, just think of all of these things that really are, they threaten to destroy us. And um, so in those stories, you see like through perseverance and especially ingenuity, all of these things that you can find a way around these things to disarm or, or sort of disempower those things that are threatening your happiness or your survival, your well-being, those types of things. And, and I just, I mean, it was such a gift to like just randomly have a curiosity about right. horsefly dress and then to encounter just these incredible lessons that I thought, oh my God, these are worth sharing because these are such universal. I mean, everybody has um, grief and heartache and you know, all of, I feel like as a settler colonial country, we're sort of have been almost required to abandon, you know, the, the tools and the stories that you had in your communities long, long, long time ago, yeah. you know, and then to just become American and whatever that means. And, you know, and so I feel like we're in a place where we struggle with a lot of um, mental health issues and I mean all of these things because we are disconnected from the stories which I think contain the wisdom of our lineages basically humans through time on these questions these big questions and, and you know I think that when I when I think about what you're saying and, and think about it makes me it makes me when you've talked about resilience and and resilience, I also wonder about that connection to language and that connection to writing and that sense um, of even when it doesn't come out as a complete poem, even when it isn't, but how, how that sense of resilience appears in even different kinds of writing, but you know, how it feels different to hold it, for you to hold these poems in published form, right? Instead of being like, here's the sketchy draft of the thing, <laughs> right? But both can, both can feel uh -huh. like they had, um, like something happened in the creation of the thing, even if it isn't a book yet. But I guess my question is about the, the 
the collection of those lessons and the connection between those and, and a sense of your own connection and resilience and having having this out where other people can see it. Yeah, well, it's I, very different, right? To go, I know other people, all yeah. of you, can also read this by yourselves. I know. I, I'm not, it's it's kind of, weird when you first... Yeah. It is because <laughs> you're just like divulging. I mean, it's kind of like a sort of... <laughs> encrypted journal almost, you know, you're like, here's how I feel about the deepest, you know, <laughs> something, and, um, yeah, but I, like I said, I just felt like the stories and the lessons and the ideas I encountered were so powerful, and to me just seemed too useful and too relevant to, to not um, try to bring broader attention to. Um, I might pause. We have brought up a lot of big questions and ideas, and I know um, some of you have read other pieces, and I wondered, if we could, I'd love to hear what you all are thinking about, or questions you have, or if you have particular poems that Kim hasn't read that you would like to hear her read, or thoughts or responses. Can you read the one about your poems as well? Oh, yeah. The Easter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Machichet. She is a wood warbler hatched into madness. She emerged from milky shell, earthen brown blotches, not roar sedge, not robin, but warbler. Open mouthed swallow of hard chipped notes, call smothered inside her smoke gray chamber of throat, disappearing between branches, muted yellow-green tail feathers and body, dainty clawed toes, white lines half circle her eyes sense but can't see, at the center of night movements misfire, misreads the body, responds on its own. I, I, I know I used to ask her questions, but I had also wanted to ask if you read that as well. Yeah. yeah, that Bye. relates to my sister as well. Um, yeah, I like this poem. It's so, so interesting to me. Um, death as a lens, expose, to make bare, to uncover, to disclose. A male ruffed grouse lies lifeless, neck, limp, eyelids soft. He would be food and so much more, crouching so my sons could see. My father slit open the delicate casing of his craw, exposing whole snowberries in perfect whiteness, crisp and toothy emerald nine bark leaves nestling tiny brown seeds and buffalo berries still crimson red. Seeing the innermost contents of his body revealed his recent unobserved behavior and brought two separate moments of intimate exposure into curious alignment. Nefariousness forced itself when I was a child, witness to human cruelty and whole detachment I had not known existed. Brutality, or down, direct, and blatant, so unabashed in its delivery, the sharpest knowing is with one's eyes. Um, 
Yeah, so this is actually about um, a funeral I went to that was my nephew, who was a stillborn. He died um, a week before his birth date, or his due date. And, um, and, it was, and it was just like a very profound and very sad occasion. And, um, you know, I was, well, should I read? I'll just read the poem first, I guess, so people can contextualize my response. But, yeah, it's called A Child's Funeral. I find myself in the building where I attended church as a child. I sit fingering my wrists, feeling for my bison horn bracelets, gifts from my father that I wear for good luck. But who needs luck at a funeral, I think? Mind wander to a study that found unanswered prayers are the primary reason people abandon faith in their God. I consider this idea of reciprocal abandonment, slip questions of the forsaken back to when I was a girl, back further still to a most famous cry of the damned. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking about you know, in, in the Bible, and there's like so many books in the Bible that sort of like put a different twist on the story of Jesus on the cross calling out um, to God, the Father, you know, why have you forsaken me? Like, why, why are you allowing me to be um, crucified? And, um, you know, and then there's, depending upon the, the author, there's those different interpretations of really what he said or why he said it or what, you know, like the deeper meaning behind that. But um, but for me, those are just like such, that's such a profound question. And the idea of being forsaken, um, being abandoned, and how, like I said, I read a study, interestingly, on, um, you know, people's faith. And, and really, they said that one of the reasons people lose faith in a creator or creation or God is um, unanswered prayers. So they've asked for something they didn't receive. And so that's the end of, they're like, well, it must not be real instead of, I mean, maybe they're posing maybe just a slightly inaccurate <laughs> question, maybe. But I don't know, who knows, really. But. Um, yeah, so I, I was thinking about um, when I was a little girl, and literally, I my mom brought us to church with, with her when we were little, and um, <laughs> and I I was in a situation one time where you know I was I prayed for safety to God, like I had been trained, and nothing happened, and that was like I think I was like five years old, and that was my first like massive paradigm shift about, you know, what is God real and, you know, why can this happen to kids and why can, you know, just like all of these things that my mom has trained me in this, it was all, you know, <laughs> I, you know, it was just all of those big questions and, um, yeah, so that poem is about that and sort of speaks to, you know, the things that we pray for, or even if, you know, you don't pray, maybe you're, like, deeply hoping for, <laughs> or you're, you want to manifest, and what happens when it doesn't. And there's actually a related poem called Rescue, where uh, one of my friends named Kevin Kicking Woman, he has this beautiful, beautiful, sort of like a, a memoir. Um, it's a play, but it's it's a, it's like a memoir, and um, the performance is really amazing. Um, but he, part of that um, play, he talks about being a young man, and his father died, and um, he said after that he went in the bathroom, and. He, he turned off the light and he said, Jesus, if you are real, my father will be next to me when I turn on the light. And he just kept turning it off and on. And of course, his father never appeared there. And so I, I, I write about those, like what does that, what do those things do to us? Like how do they impact us when we encounter those experiences like that? Like I was praying for rescue, but it didn't happen. Then I also write a different poem about, um, the remnant Nala Skyly who 
And it wasn't actually until I was writing about that poem in the metaphor of the people eating monster that I understood I, that I understood the experience that was like so uh, foundational to me as a person from like my early <laughs> memories. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, so I think. Well, there's something deeply unsafe feeling about grief. Right? It feels like exposed, <laughs> right? But it feels unsafe and yeah. it feels wrong, even though rationally we can say like, oh, no, this is. It, however, in the most peaceful sense, sometimes, or even if we're talking about the loss of someone, but there's so many different kinds of griefs also, um, and they, they they make us feel unsure of the ground, no. right? Um, I know one of my favorite lines ever from one of Patricia Godica's poems, mm -hmm. and I can't even say which poem it was because I only remember the line, but she talked about the uh, grief being like walking along in a sidewalk and just falling off, like suddenly there's just a nothing there. You know, in one step, it's gone. And um, that, that sinking yeah. physical sense of falling. Um, well, you know, I think that historically different cultures had ways of like ch better training people to deal with things. <laughs> and, <laughs> Not talking about things ever to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, one of our elders said that every morning, like at sunrise, all the youth to get up and dip and um, go, they had to submerge themselves in cold water. And now you see like, oh, Wim Hof and this, you know, cold therapy, you see all of these like benefits to those types of things. But, you know, and just, there's, there were so many small things that as I've learned more about, um, you know, processing grief and health and wellness generally, um, I see there was like so much wisdom in these practices and you know, sweating in a sweat lodge or a sauna or just those types of things, prayer, um, also fasting. I mean, people used to fast a lot more. Yeah, I mean, all of those things I feel like sort of help train your body to be okay in, in the unknown or when something unexpected happens to you because it's, it's less, it's more familiar, I guess. So you don't have that harsh reaction, I think. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I have, there's a place um, that I like to go hiking a, a couple times a week. I like to get there. And somehow years ago, I, in one spot, I, I suddenly was like, oh, this, this is where I would love to have my ashes scattered. You know, and I remember saying it out loud to whoever I was with, and they're like, wow, <laughs> dark. And I was like, no, no, it doesn't feel dark. Like, it was like, I realized I love this, this one little area. I felt so attached to it. And then, it, it, and then because I got so attached to it, it became, like, it, it became a practice of befriending that sensibility of saying, like, well, I am not dead right now. <laughs> Good job. Um, which I think is, it is, like, you know, after a certain number of, like, experiences where you're like well, unsure sometimes as crazy as that sounds I'm like where am I on the spectrum of like how alive am I right this minute I can't tell um, and so it became a thing you know where I was like I'm not dead I would like pause on my run and be like maybe sometime but not right this minute not so far today um, can keep going you know on down on down the path um, and, I, and I think there are ways to I know there are um, in Buddhism, the five remembrances, and I can never remember all five, so I'm glad that this is not a quiz. Um, but the one I really fixate on, um, which is the one I remember, um, because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty much like, um, you know, I, I am of a body, and a body is of a nature to grow well and die. You know, I mean, these are the things you have to remember, and the one that I can never get past is um, the last one, of course, that says, like, um, I, I will at some point be separated from everyone and everything I love. And it is like every time I see, I mean, even now, like I'm like, oh, that can't be true. Um, but it's, it is a practice of like, um, of like, I guess, feeling it in tiny bits, you know, of like of letting it in in a controlled moment or getting it out in a piece of writing. And I know those are pieces for me where I can, I, I'm like, okay, well. From that moment, I can try to put something in words, but I don't know what it will offer me. You know, it isn't necessarily sad, though sometimes it's really surprisingly light and happy after I've let, I feel like we put in a lot of energy to pushing that, that thing that we do deeply know away, right? Like, we do deeply know some of these things, but we don't want to know them. 
so we spend a lot of energy pushing it away, and then when little little windows open, right? Um, and now and now I'm like quiz my kids when we go up there. I'm like, what is this place? <laughs> Where are you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. See, fun conversations. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that way. Um, but is it beautiful, please? I know. Uh, I'm, cu I'm curious to hear what all you are thinking about. Thoughts or questions? Are you talking about the, um, the studies of people's brains and then um, you're, you're speaking about your dreams? I know that there have been studies where they've had people remember their dreams and then remember their memories. And it looks the same as far as the brain is concerned. A remembered brain is the same as a remembered memory. So maybe you know those those stories that are told to you and the stories that you're telling yourself in your own head at night have the same weight as you know your real experiences. Feels true, right? Like internally feels. Yeah, um, that reminds me when you're talking about like memory and imagination and how they're kind of not separate and like how you can have memories that didn't actually happen. But I was like, yes, because I don't know, until, probably until I was like 12 or 14 or something, I have this concrete memory of being at the hospital when my little sister was born. Um, and I remember specifically like waiting in the lobby, like what I wasn't in the room while during the birth, I was in the, in the lobby watching the fishes in the fish tank. I remember it still so vividly. And when I told, at some point, you know, I was a teenager, I told my parents about it, and they were like, what? You, you were at the nannies. You were <laughs> never at the hospital. We came to pick you up alone. <laughs> and that just blew my mind. And I was like, no, this happened. And I was, at the time, I was like two and a half when she was born. So it was like, I don't know why that memory was created. Like I felt like I needed to be there or something. Right, we dig in on those though. They feel so real. In fact, I know the only fights one of my I have three sisters and one of them we've only ever, ever had fights about whether or not something happened <laughs> when we were young. That was it. I was like, You remember you were there. She's like, Why? And she and she's not she's the most pacifist. She's like, I believe you. <gasps> you're lying! You're lying! She was like, but it's more important to you than it is to me, so you're right. And I was like, no, 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 I want it to really be true. Yes. Um, it was not satisfying to have her just be like, yes, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious to hear other, what are other, some of your reactions in thinking about memory or story and grief or trying to write about some of those experiences of your own. Then you can try to do that. I'm really interested in mean, you, you said multiple times this evening that this is kind of like a coded journal. What's it like trying to rewrite and edit a journal, trying to publish a journal, trying to decide what parts are going to be in the collection and what isn't? How, how does that change having such a personal investment and understanding of what it means to you. Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, I, I would, like, like you know, it, I would sort of encrypt some of, like, I put the Salish title on my sister one, which now everybody, I mean, you can look in the glossary and find that, but, um, like, I didn't want it to be readily apparent, some of the stuff, just, you know, because it was people's grief, you know, it, um, so I wanted to be respectful of you know those those occasions and especially like for other people and when people shared stories with me you know like the tribal leaders and stuff those belong to those families and um, I yeah, yeah so I I've tried to be sensitive to um, you know other people's feelings when I was writing about um, that but I I literally. So this became, so quickly, I was like so drawn to horsefly dress. And I started writing her into, there's one poem in here, which was one of the earlier ones that I wrote. Um, it says, and this is just one of the stanzas in it, but it says, horsefly dress tries to believe there are no casualties. You know, that everything happens for a purpose. So she tries to believe that, and, and I was, um, 
like when I started writing about her in a way that wasn't coming like out of oral traditions, I went and I talked to um, Tony Koshola, <laughs> my relative at the culture committee, to ask about, can I just do this? <laughs> like, is this right? And um, and all he said to me was, uh, he said, you know, just be really um, aware of the distinction between like receiving and creating information. And so after that point, and that was like very early on, but after that point, um, before I ever worked on this, before I ever did any like editing, or I would do before anything, every time I would just smudge. Oh, so I would pray so that that I wouldn't, you know, have my own sort of. I'm trying to omit my, my, I don't know, my perspective or my ego or my anything from it and just have it be, um, you know, you hear people say a lot that like artists can act as vessels for, you know, this collective something and so I just felt like I tried to, um, I don't know, be very respectful with the things that I put in and just trust that it was okay if I was putting it in there that, you know, that it was okay to be in there if it, was coming to me. So. Yeah. Um, I think in, I think about and write about grief a lot in in regards to the like, climate and the planet and that takes maybe it's a different not a different kind of grief, but a specific kind of grief. And it feels sometimes like a loved one is dying and you're like holding in her hand at her bedside and it's also partially your fault. Um, and I wonder if that kind of grief finds its way in your writing. Um, I think so, like those big things that feel like you can affect, like they're just kind of going. But I do have a poem called Baby Out of Cut Open Woman, which is the name of the weather being that brought about the end of the last ice age. So for me, when I think about like climate change, I mean, I do believe <laughs> humans are exacerbating it and there's a lot we should rein in. And I mean, there's, you know, all of that stuff. But I do find comfort in that I, people have been through enormous challenges before and at least some people will survive, <laughs> you know, is, is how I think about it. And, it. and it feels okay and to me, I think that um, you know those massive resets are are okay, even though they're so. I mean, you don't want to think about yourself or anyone you love having to go through drought or you know, like just these types of things. But um, yeah, I feel like that it's like that story about when. Um, I mean, it'd be easier to have you know that I say age and then all the water go away. Like, you know, it's, it's like not exactly um, on the same um, scale in terms of the hardships presented, but it was massive and there were mass extinctions of animals and, you know, those are documented in oral traditions. And so I feel like people have experienced those massive, massive um, changes in their environments and they, um, at least some people have, you know, survived them. Could you read that book? Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's called Baby Out of Cut Open Woman. So called because he was called the lineage, cut out of the stomach as an infant. Indeed he survived the unbelievable, a lucky break to become the only living member of his immediate family. Another lucky break, he won his race against the cold birds, earning the right to make a law that they could no longer control all the weather, ending the age of ice. Next, he gathered his family's bones, their marrowed rim, limbs, each rib, forearm, and finger. Covering them with his blanket, he jumped over four times, bringing them, each one, back <coughs> to life. These are the stories that belong here, that pushed up through this soil, unfurling as arrowleaf, balsam root leaves, and boulders found in unusual places. How else does a thing enter this world 
now so changed we struggle to hear the shapes of a language that no longer fits every ear. Each story word fragment moves over hills, the highest reaches of trees without catching in memory, but the crispness of Simlaki, of Bolansutin like fire, crackle the flick of sound a body remembers. Um, but I think in, in my reference to these are the stories that belong here, you know, the stories that are sort of infused into the sort of the fabric of our country are, you know, <laughs> they're, they're from the Quran, they comprise our Old Testament. And, and um, so what we have is someone else's history as our sort of touch point. But the histories that have already happened here, I think, is so important and so uh, valuable for people to know. And in those stories is uh, really a lot of information about how to live in your place in a sustainable way, <laughs> which is very, um, I think, a very important message. Uh, and it makes me think, too, in thinking about that, that category of, of grief, is, is this, um, there's like, it almost feels like an anticipatory. I had a friend, we had a debate about whether anticipatory grief could exist. Like, and I was like, but is that just fear? <laughs> you know, I was like, would that be being afraid of something? Afraid of uh, an experience? Um, but I, I can, but I do think there is something that's very specific that isn't necessarily fear. It is, a, is just a really deep awareness of, of, of grief for a thing that is unfolding, right? I know I'm. Uh, my mom has Alzheimer's and still knows my sisters and I. But it is. It's a very. It's like a. It's like watching the waves go in and come out. Like she's there and she's not there, right? And so it is like a grief that gets relieved and then comes back. Um, and so it, it. And there's you. You always know what the end is going to be, even though we always sort of know the end. It's just like a, a, the watching the path of it. Um, and that's what got me thinking about, like, well, I, I'm already sad about what I know will come. Um, and so trying trying to even, trying to, to find words for being sad about a thing. I mean, those are the moments where, like, but I'm sad about a thing that hasn't happened exactly. But it has happened if I feel sad. If I'm feeling grief about it, it is happening then, even if other people are not seeing it. Um, I, I feel like there, that is a big space that writing holds, that, that holds for me, where I'm like, I'm making this valid. Like, I'm writing this thing out, and now it exists, because now it's in words, and I put it on this paper. Yeah, and what, <laughs> what you just said actually made yeah. me think that, um, like, and I did not mean to, like, indicate that I think, you know. Like, no, I didn't take it. It's yeah. just coming, so just. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because no, um, I think that, um, I didn't take it. Okay. Yeah. Because there are things that we can do, and there's lots and lots of people. I feel like working in public policy, like you, you are more likely to see the activity uh, that is, the, all the energy that is focused around addressing big to tiny, yeah, anything, anything. And so there's always opportunity to engage. And um, I remember a story about Terry Tempest Williams about um, creating, um, protecting wilderness areas, I think she was doing. But, you know, people said, oh, what can writers do? You just write about it. It's in some journal some other writer might read, but maybe not, you know. And, but she uh, went around and she had people, a bunch of writers, write about, like, their connection and the meaning of these places. And they made this beautiful book and gave to Congress and that, like, facilitated the protection of those places. And so I do think that there's lots of things that people can do about it. That's probably a good place yeah. to, to break and wrap up. Thank you so much, um, you know, for this conversation and, and thank you all for coming. Let's thank them again. Thank you. Uh, March seventh, a week from today, uh, we're going to extend the conversation to Irish traditions of grief and lament. Uh, Bernadette Sweeney, a theater professor at UN, will be here with Katie Kane, um, and that is actually a two-week. Uh, it'll be 7th and the 14th, and we'll talk about Irish traditions spread across the two weeks leading up to 
St. Patrick's Day, of course. <laughs> so uh, please come back for that. And um, if you didn't sign up, if you didn't, the sign-up sheet didn't come to you, we have one. If you want to put your email down, we'll put it kind of at this front table and you can give that to us. Otherwise, um, share your evaluations with us. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you.